So, hello all, welcome to this session of the Food in the Book Conference. Uh, over the next one hour, we'll be addressing the theme of food and race in early modern period. And we all here believe that it's very pertinent in the times that we are living in right now. And before I hand over the session to Gitanjali, who is our first panelist, uh, I would just like to remind you all that you can keep on sending in your questions, which we will address towards the end, once all the speakers are done with their presentations. And Gitanjali, you can take over. Thank you, Neha. I know you're doing this at the middle of, I think in the middle of the night, your time. And thank you to everyone uh, behind the scenes who's been working so hard to make food in the book possible. Also a big hello to everyone in our virtual audience. Uh, as some of you may know, last Tuesday was International Coffee Day. Next week, the UK will celebrate International Curry Week. And in May, you might look out for International Tea Day. I tell you about these days not to chronicle any hashtags or celebrations associated with them. Rather, I want you to momentarily think about your gut response to them. The ubiquity in your takeout rituals, your workday addictions, your wellness treatments, such that a curry or a coffee day might even seem redundant. Depending on your time zone, you might even be craving any one of these items, even as I speak. I do not mean to assume that they are universally liked or entrenched in our food ways, although that's certainly possible for many of us, but their textures and sensations are familiar in a variety of global taste stacks in ways that we take for granted. What if we were to trouble the sense of taken for grantedness? What if we were, for instance, to trace these global taste stacks to the contact zones in which they are forged? Where might we find such encounters performed and registered? I will not attempt to answer all these questions in the time I have. After all, there should be opportunities where you can come back for seconds. Uh, but I do want to briefly gesture at ways in which we might seek out these contact zones in printed texts, such as travelogues, ballads, broadsides, and recipes that overtly and incidentally document encounters with different foods. It is here that we see some of the earliest articulations of difference. Differences that recall the cultural and geographical points of origin of foreign foods, differences that are perceived as resulting from physiological contact with foreign foods, differences that are affectively performed in response to the taste, smells, and textures of foreign foods. These are what I'm calling gut responses. Gut responses reveal how the taste of different foods are registered in, by the language of racial and religious difference, and equally how racial and religious differences are made palatable or not via the taste of different foods. Contact zones, as we know from Mary Louis Pratt's work, are never benign. And culinary contact zones, as I will argue, are particularly contested. The cup of coffee, for instance, that you're probably holding right now, in its earliest incarnations in 17th century England, was variously described in ballads and broadsides as a Mohammedan gruel, an ugly Turkish enchantress, a bold Asian brat, a Jew, and an infidel. Affiliations that variously derive from coffee's supposed origins in Ethiopia, its popularity throughout Ottoman and Mughal territories, and its supposed introduction into English social life via Jewish purveyors. The Maiden's Complaint Against Coffee, a short treatise published in 1663, brings a more pronounced racial dimension to these affiliations, claiming that coffee made it a Christian far blacker within than ever was the black man's skin. A 1672 broadside against coffee, also called the marriage of the Turk, very explicitly ties these racial and religious affiliations to none other than Othello, claiming that coffee is like Shakespeare's Moor, contaminating the pure as water Desdemona. Its recipe for coffee follows the Othello plot closely. Coffee and water, Othello and Desdemona, are brought together with a great stir. He is beaten into a union, she is distilled into it. Of course, she is overcome and taken over by the more, referring to the process by which water fully takes on the flavor of coffee. And by the end of the ballad, the more who is now referred to as a Turk destroys her entirely. Another 1663 ballad calling itself a cup of coffee starts out by calling the drink a Turkish swell, then deems it the product of the Jew and the infidel, and concludes by taking a scatological turn, tying all these religious affiliations to bodily waste. In being the product of the other, it might as well be what the ballad calls piss and cack. In other words, coffee is disgusting, by the, uh, made so precisely by the contact it facilitates with all manner of infidels. This mode of encountering the food of the other in order to render it the absolute opposite of food, as filth, as waste, as excrement even, appears repeatedly in the culinary contact zone. It is where cliches such as one man's food is another man's poison draw from. It's also where shows such as bizarre foods derive their popularity from. 
the intrepid culinary hero tests the threshold of the edible, eating coral worms in Samoa and horse rectum sausages in Kazakhstan, foods that do not get a day or a hashtag. This figure has precedence in early modern travelogues where the performance of disgust around the edible, that is seemingly inedible, becomes a necessary ritual in the culinary contact zone. Christopher Freik, a surgeon traveling along the Cape of Good Hope with the Dutch East India Company in the late 1600s, claims to have taken flight at the site of the hot and dots dinner. A broiling piece of cowhide, the dung squeezed out of the guts and spread finely on the hide to moisten it. He says the very ordering of it in this manner turned my stomach so that I could not stay to see the eating of it, but I made all the haste I could to be gone. Fry briefly suspends the objective ethnographic gaze he professes to adopt elsewhere in the travelogue. Disgust at the sight of the hot and tots food, it would seem, gets in the way of proper ethnographic observation that the seeing man seeks out in his travels. Versions of Fright's narrative abound in the discourse of the Cape. Travelers before and after Fright tend to record some version of his disgust at the scene of bizarre foods. The following is noted in an anonymous journal entry kept aboard Sir Edward Michelbone's voyage to the Cape in 1605. In all the time of our being there, they lived upon the guts and filth of the meat. They would neither wash nor make clean the guts, but take them and cover them with hot ashes. And before they were through hot, they pulled them out, shaking them a little in their hands, and so ate the guts, the excrements, and the ashes. The cumulative effect of these travelogues is such that at a particular point in the discourse of the cave, it becomes a convention to suspend objective ethnographic observation in order to perform and record the sensation of disgust associated with the inhabitants of the cave. There is also extreme gastronomic delight and a sense of adventure in the culinary contact zone. The Italian runaway Nicolai Manucci claims to have fainted when he ate beetle leaf in Surat on the west coast of India, what my South Asian audiences will probably know as pawn, uh, which left a bloody mark on everyone's lips. For Manucci, eating and surviving the pond during ritual, even though he did faint, is a kind of challenge. He first obtains it from a female acquaintance and writes of his gut response as follows. Having taken them, my head swam to such an extent that I feared I was dying. It caused me to fall down. I lost my color and endured agonies, but she poured into my mouth a little salt and brought me to my senses. The lady reassured me that everyone who ate it for the first time felt the same effects. That's quite a lot of drama for Pound. <laughs> Reverend Edward Terry, who traveled to the Mughal Empire between 1616 and 1619 and tasted mutton do piazza, a type of curry cooked in an onion gravy, claimed that it was the most savory meat he had ever eaten. I almost think it is the very dish which Jacob made for his father, was his food review of the dishes served at the Emperor Jahangir's court. This curry remains a staple in global cuisine with egg, lamb, and chicken variants. Coffee, of course, appears on global menus too, where it is no longer listed as a Turkish enchantress, opis, or cac, although it is listed as Othello coffee, by the way. As global foods and beverages, they are the antithesis of foods that remain behind as abject matter, as bizarre foods, as unassimilated vestiges of difference. The early encounters in the culinary contact zone do not necessarily adjudicate the process by which they become food or filth, global foods or bizarre foods. That process is far more fluid and contingent in ways that bear longer discussion. But it is in the gut responses to these foods that we see how difference is experienced at an elementary level in ways that are far more messy, visceral, and embodied than the model of imperial eyes or the colonial gaze allows for. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Gitanjali. Now we'll move on to Jennifer. Um, thank you, Naha. And, um... Uh, and thank you so much to all the organizers for this incredible conference with so many thought-provoking sessions and um, more to come uh, as well. Uh, Leah and Becky and everyone at the Newberry, David, Amanda, all the folks with the Before Farm to Table project at the Fulcher Institute, uh, my fellow, fellow panelists, and also to everyone tuning in today. Um, so I want to begin with a nod to the um, opening conversation of food and the book with chefs and authors, and in particular, Michael Twitty's striking comment about the erasures that occur in written um, food and recipe cultures and archives. Um, and I think that this fundamentally frames my investment in thinking about food and race and the book in early modern England and continental Europe in my um, research. So the title that I'd submitted for my contribution today is Eating Bodies in Renaissance Europe. Um, and this is inspired by Keila Tompkins' work on racial indigestion 
Eating Bodies in the 19th Century, um, published by NYU Press. Um, here it is, <laughs> thought I would show and tell as well. Um, and both Keela's work, and um, I'm gonna put a plug here for Gitanjali's um, book too, Gitanjali's wonderful new book, um, Tasting Difference, Food, Race, and Cultural Encounters in Early Modern Literature, just published with Cornell um, this year, uh, pr really provides such cogent um, paradigms for thinking about food and race together for me as a literary scholar. Um, I've been thinking about the trope of eating bodies for some time now um, and how to read both the presences and the absences of bodies that are eaten in and across texts. My focus has been on the medieval and early modern substance mummy, which scholars have referred to as a type of corpse drug. Um, what Louise Noble has identified as a sanctioned form of medicinal cannibalism in early modern Europe. Uh, and the common idea of what mummy is um, was that it was a medicine derived from pulverized human corpses and used as an ingredient in recipes that span ingestible remedies um, to bombs that can be applied on the skin. What has been particularly striking for me in researching the substance is parsing out what bodies were purported to comprise the material for this medicinal ingredient. And what appears over and over again in early modern English and European uh, travel narratives and medical treatises in descriptions of mummy is the emphasis that it was a, quote, foreign um, substance. And this is from the vantage point of um, the early modern English or the uh, early modern Europeans. So the substance was believed to originate abroad, often in the Middle Ages, I'm uh, sorry, Middle East, I'm sorry, and Africa, um, and to be consumed um, domestically uh, in, in, say, early modern Europe, which is the primary period I look at. So in his 1640 botanical, um, John Parkinson specifically describes mummy as, um, and I quote here, the very body of a man, man and woman brought chiefly from Egypt or Syria adjoining and no other part of the world so good, which is embalmed after the manner was used in those countries only. Um, French physician Ambrose uh, Paré echoes this, describing what often is referred to as um, true mummy or authentic mummy, as specifically um, that, quote, taken from the monuments and stony tombs of the anciently dead in Egypt, of which the same or their broken members are brought to Venice from Syria and Egypt and thence dispersed all over Christendom. So the significant question to be raised with all of this is, what did it mean for early modern Europeans to ingest the literal bodies of, um, uh, and I quote Joseph Duquesne here, Syrians, Egyptians, Arabians, and Jews, and to understand that consumption through the texts that informed them. And for the specific purposes of this session, I'm interested in raising the question um, of the particular kind of text uh, on this slide. And so Neha, if you could um, put the slide up, please. Okay, so, so this, for the uh, specific purposes of, of this session, I was interested in raising this question of, um, uh, of this uh, text here, how we might include something like this in our reading across a range of material texts um, to understand the racial dimensions of human bodies as food and their implications. Um, and so this is what I, um, you know, want to use to, to prompt further future conversation, juxtaposing this alongside what I've narr narrated is, um, is here the phenomenon of mummy appearing in medieval and early modern herbals, botanicals, books of simples. Um, and uh, this one in particular is, uh, um, is, is a, a 15th century French manuscript, um, uh, Livre de Simple Medicine, um, so a book of, of kind of medicinal ingredients here. Um, so a simple, um, and I draw from the Oxford English Dictionary here, was, was basically an ingredient to be used for a medicinal preparation. So what do we make of the fact um, that mummy appears in, in herbals and botanicals alongside the likes of plants like mint and the mandrake, uh, which is literally what happens um, in this particular manuscript. And so, you know, mummy is sort of, um, sort of, you know, shoved in into the in the into the text, uh, you know, between these two um, these two other entries for mint and, and the mandrake. Um, who's 
corpse are we meant to understand as being represented in a literal catalog of medicinal ingredients? How does race and food converge in this book, in this representation of mummy? And so I want to end on this question and prompt us to consider how we read mummy through and across and between all of these kinds of texts as a site of racial and culinary inquiry. In doing so, I follow the lead of Marissa Fuentes in her valuable study on dispossessed lives um, published by um, Penn Press to trace what she articulates as, um, quote, uh, the difficulties in narrating ephemeral archival presences by dwelling on the fragmentary disfigured bodies. Um, for Fuentes, um, it's of enslaved women, and for me here, of the racialized and othered human bodies that are repurposed into food, medicine, object of experiment, remedy, or preservative for other bodies. Um, as, uh, as geographer Catherine Yusoff has articulated, it is the, quote, border in the division of materiality and its subjects as inhuman and human, and thus as inert or agentic matter um, that operationalizes race. And it is to this project that I hope to offer this reflection about mummy, race, and food in the early modern book. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Sorry, I went away for a second. Uh, we'll move on to Nick now. Great. Um, hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello, everybody. It's um, a pleasure to be with you all today. And I echo with my fellow roundtable participants my gratitude and thanks um, for bringing us, bringing us together to, to speak about these important matters and topics about that intersect between food and race. And so for my contribution, I have several um, distinct uh, case studies or examples that for me crystallize and, and, and bring up interesting discussion about, at least in the early modern Iberian context, um, the subject matter of how Again, food unites the discussion of race in early modern Iberia in complicated and fascinating ways that often intersect with class, gender, religion, and sexuality. And in many respects, as many of these literary texts and historical documents show us, you are indeed what you eat. And so the first case study or example I have comes from Don Quixote. And so in Don Quixote, part one from 1605, Pork and wine may be some of the most politically, politically and racially charged dishes or beverages of early modern Spain, but other foods also had symbolic value in social and literary context. In Arabic poetry, the names of fruits or flowers were used to convey loftier laudatory significance on their bearers, while the names of vegetables lent a comic or even pejorative tone. In the Libro de Buen Amor of Juan Ruiz, the, the characters Doña Hendrina and Don Melon de la Huerta, Lady Slow and Sir Melon of the or or Orchard are paradigmatic examples of this phenomenon in the Castilian tradition. It is not surprising then that a man named after a vegetable should appear among the characters of Don Quixote. This man, of course, Cide Amete Benengeli, whose last name is reminiscent of the Badinjan, the Arabic word for er eggplant that produced romantic romance variants such as the Castilian Berenjena. The eggplant's first appearance in the novel, Don Quixote, occurs when Don Quixote's squire, Sancho Panza, marvels at, the popular marvels at its popularity in chapter two. Most notably, when reporting the name of Don Quixote's, uh, or the novel Don Quixote's author translator, however, the squire mistakenly refers to him as Cide Amete Berenjena, rather than Benengeli. Upon hearing his name, Don Quixote notes, and I quote that, and he clarifies and explains to Sancho that, that the man is a Moor, and Sancho misunderstanding agrees responding, and I quote and roughly translate from the original uh, Spanish, I've heard before that the Moors are friends of eggplants, end quote. Don Quixote corrects this mistake again explaining to Sancho, and I roughly translate, um, you, Sancho, are in error of his surname. 
in that Sidi in Arabic means Lord, end quote. And yet in the slip of the tongue, while Sancho may err in his pronunciation, he does not mistake the word's meaning. Cervantes scholars have convincingly argued that in Arabic, berenjeli can mean, and, it, and again, for our interest here, this idea of the eggplant, berenjena, becomes, again, this racialized trope. Oftentimes, as we see in the Quixote, um, uh, a trope, a symbol that is used to, to racialize um, the various Siberian Muslims on the peninsula, um, Spain's North African and Maghrebi populations, as well as the um, Moriscos who are expelled or exiled um, from Spain starting at 1609 by an edict issued by Philip III. And so with the first image uh, that I have captures from, its, from the 19th century, um, from Doré around 1868, which for me is interesting to think about how, again, focusing on the character from the Quixote, Sancho Panza, how he embodies um, in his mind, um, in his fantasy and avarice that he's an imperial governor of the Isla Barataria. And so specifically with this image, part two of the 1615 Quixote lends itself to multiple food episodes that revolve around Sancho Panza, who experiences and discusses the changing face of Spain's gastronomy. In the chapters that treat Don Quixote's exchange with the Duke and Duchess, particularly in this unit of chapters 30 to 57, um, expected food celebrations and banquets are, lar are largely absent from the narrative and thus reflect the host, again, the Duke and the Duchess, their lack of genuine hospitality. When food is present, it connotes insults, contempt and destruction. Throughout this section uh, at the Ducal Palace, food imagery is used to qualify negative stereotypes and other forms of racialization. As an example, the Duchess uses oregano to discuss and to critique uh, bad gover governorship. Uh, Sancho refers to a proverb on sticky rice when he criticizes the role of the dueñas or the ladies who accompany um, this trans, this, this idea of this cross-dressing tra transgendered bearded lady figure known as the uh, Countess Trifaldi. And so in this Duke and Duchess scene from the second part of the Quixote, there's a lot of really fascinating and rich um, commentary and critique of where there's a, a, a rich intersectional crystallization of, of race, gender, sexuality, one can argue and explore the possibilities of trans topics, uh, so on and so forth, and these enchanted beards that, that the Countess Trifaldi wears and such. Um, another prompt for, the, for our roundtable asks us to explore how did the other, not being a dormant category, respond to and negotiate and articulate the self? And so for me, now turning to the, the lives and experiences, um, both particularly in, in the archive and historical archives is that of Iberian Black women. And so for me to explore this and to think about the intersection between food and race, um, the archive as an example provides rich material to, to explore these topics. And so as an example of that, it's important to think about the intimate confines of domestic spaces, such as convents, homesteads, gardens, kitchens, soap making factories, and, ro and royal palaces where Iberian Black women ate, lived, and slept. Uh, the domestic labor forge in these spaces, I suggest, illuminates the complex ways in which enslaved Black women, as well as Black women who were free, not only exercise their agency, but also most notably acquired in excess material goods, such as bleaching agents, brooms, detergents and soaps, dyes and inks, milk, both human and non-human, flour, sugar and wheat, to strategically renounce and subvert their subordinated positions in early modern Iberian society. And so for me, with a new book project that I'm working on, but also more readily in a seminar on Black Iberia that I'm teaching this semester, 
I always point out to my students that these really fascinating cases in, in 16th century, as well as 17th century Portugal, and on port cities such as Valencia and Barcelona, and also on the other side of the Atlantic in early colonial Cuba, where there were these instances and cases of free black women who owned taverns and bars and inns. Um, they gained respect, social capital, economic capital, and a lot of times with the earnings and the money that they earned, they would then free other enslaved Blacks. And so for me, this is one particular, this stands as one um, case study, kind of case study that um, on the one hand shows how, again, Iberian Black women utilized, um, you know, food and material culture to, to, have an, to have a position in place in Iber early modern Iberian society but also with these cases to really trouble and to destable one's assumptions, especially in the 21st century, of these notions of, of subordination. Another fascinating example comes from Simon Aguado's Entremes, short skit play, Entremes de los Negros from 1602. And in this particular text, it shows that eating and feasting operate as racially performative acts. And for example, we see in this particular skit play um, the presence of Africanized Castilian known as um, Habla de Negros, so called Habla de Negros during the period. And so there's one, there's one very long exhaustive passage in this skit play where there's a repetition, there's a banquet scene, and there's this repetition where um, Blacks who are called to perform um, there, there's this repetition of, of, of food, cakes, different herbs, um, vegetables, um, cannelloni, chicken consomme, so on and so forth. And so for me, in this particular passage, I write about in my book, Staging Habla de Negros, but for our interest um, for today, it's really fascinating to think about how this particular banquet scene of the skit centers and links the image, the image of food with hospitality, grace, bonding, and celebration. In the ceremonious cer celebratory scene, the black, mouth, the black mouth speaks, laughs, and eats in the face of the violent desires of white supremacy. In fact, speech, laughter, and eating are conjoined tropes of the black cultural presence and resistance op operative in Aguados Los Negros. And also interesting to consider would be how in this particular banquet scene, how it illustrates the sonic onomatopoeia and vocalization of the play's conglomeration of black performers, Africanized Castilian. And within it, the various African sounding grunts, hums, musicality, sounds, and vocables salient throughout the, med the medley um, evoke a uniquely Black slave culture alive in early modern Spain. Moving ahead to the second image, focusing on Portugal and Lisbon as an, as an urban center, like Seville, Spain, um, being the heart of the African slave trade, which Portugal has had initiated with Africa in the 15th century, supplying Spain as well as, as, well as its own plantations in Madeira, with slave labor. And so the royal monopoly on colonial trade channeled great wealth directly through the city of customs or the Casa da India and Mina, such as Brazil wood, jaggery and sugar from around the world, spices, ceramics, and precious stones from Asia, gold from Sub-Saharan Africa, furniture, wine, sugar, and dye stuffs from the mid-Atlantic islands, timber came from Poland and wheat from the Azores, German and, I and Italian financiers and merchant bankers set up shop on the Rua Nova dos Mercadores, which is the image, ah, sorry, I, don't, I didn't show that image, but it's one important thoroughfare in district um, in Lisbon during the time where there were foreign embassies um, arriving from as far as the Maldives, the Kingdom of Congo and Japan to pay their respects to the king, um, Senhor das Conquistas e Navegações. 
a king whose sovereignty extended not, ju not just over land, but sea. And so in Lisbon in the mid 1580s, uh, for example, the Jesuit Manuel Correa stated that there were over 20 diverse black nations in the city, highlighting the diversity of sub-Saharan Africans, both enslaved and free. And to that effect, the actual number of blacks would have immediately impressed visitors from, nor from Northern Europe who carried their own racial ba baggage and biases. Examples um, of this, such as the street sellers as the regateras, which would be the third image um, published by, um, or written, composed by Shiadu in 1536. Um, and so the regateras were the street vendors, market vendors, many of them, just as they were European descended, street vendors, um, there were, many of them were African women. And so particularly uh, with a quick glance from this frontispiece from the 1550 edition held by the National Library in Lisbon shows one of, one of the five women depicted there as black. And, and again, with these women, they, they commonly sold um, snacks such as cooked beans in aletria or pasta, beside, um, besides more essential supplies such as olive oil and seafood, as they shouted their, their wares and, and called for attention and, and announcing prices for, the, for their products and items. They also sold uh, rice pudding, couscous and chickpeas from pots, stewed prunes were popular with the sick, and the Brandao census reports uh, commended these women, particularly the, the black women, recovering their food with fresh, freshly laundered uh, cloths, a laudable attention to cleanliness. Um, in this, in an example of this would be in the second image coming particularly depicting a, um, black street vendor, Vendadera, in Felipe Lobo's Vista do Mosteiro dos Jerónimos. So for, this would be in Lisbon from in, um, Belen, in the district where the Belen Tower is um, depicting an African-descended woman carrying on her atop her head, these types of, it could have been chippy fritters, bacalao fritters, and to close, and just thinking about and to incorporate um, my colleagues, um, Jennifer and Gitanjali's comments, opening remarks. Um, this makes me think about how in Spain, particularly um, the, conquito, the conguitos candy. And I'm not sure if many of you have you know, traveled to Spain or if this type of candy has caught your attention, but the conguitos candy, which clearly is this, you know, has this little boy, clearly with these you know, very racist and problematic um, animalizing um, references, likening um, you know, black bodies being for sale as candy, makes me think about the colonial legacy and even the post-colonial post critiques that we could also think about, consider uh, with respect to Spain's colonial presence in equatorial, in equatorial Guinea, which still shores up a host of um, discomfort, um, confusion and rage, both for, you know, tourists as well as um, African and African descended um, people living, communities living in Spain today. So I'll stop there. Um. Thank you, uh, Jennifer, Gitanjali, and Nick. We have some questions coming in, so I will just take those. So Wendy Wall uh, says, uh, her question is for Gitanjali and Jennifer. She's saying she's thinking uh, that how disgust bears an imprint, imprint of desire, and can you both reflect on how these intertwined with the gut response of coffee being racialized connected to the exoticism of uh, luxury foreign goods? or the way that mummy has eaten might smack of positive desire to assimilate the other. Thanks, Neha, and hi, Wendy. Uh, I'll respond to that uh, with regard to coffee specifically, uh, where we see that, uh, I mean, of course, des desire is the other side of disgust. And I have to wonder if some of the responses that are written 
uh, to suggest that coffee is disgusting are in fact responding to that desire. And we see that in visual culture. Uh, we see that in um, uh, Augusta de Cruz's portraits, Carl Van Loo's portraits, where uh, coffee is often uh, documented in the margins, you know, through all the paraphernalia uh, that comes with coffee. But along with that is the figure of the Moor, sometimes even, you know, a figure that we know of, like Zamore the Moor, who's with the coffee paraphernalia. And that's where the desire for coffee is most apparent. Uh, and I think some of the ballads and broadsides are responding to that desire through disgust. And I'll let Jennifer speak to maybe mommy. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Hello, hello Wendy. Um, yeah. Thank you for for such a wonderful question. Um, I um, it, it is really kind of interesting to think about mummy in relation to I think disgust and and desire. I think precisely because um, you know I, I came I came to mummy from a number of the the literary and dramatic sources, right? And so um, in the way that it kind of comes up in say. Um, you know, John Webster's The White Devil, for example, um, it's, it, um, yeah, this, this idea that it's a kind of unnatural physic that makes you, you know, vomit. Um, uh, and yet, um, it, it being kind of worked with very seriously in these different descriptions, right, whether they're the travel narratives or whether they're the, the kind of medical treatises. Um, I think what you kind of mentioned about the um, the desire to assimilate the, the, you know, the the other through like as the Eucharist, for example, um, being a certain kind of desire. And I wonder here if um, uh, similar to what Gitanjali is saying, right, where they're are sort of you know maybe two sides of the same coin. Um, I think something that's really interesting about mummy as a substance is um, is how it doesn't seem to um, at least in the descriptions I've read, it doesn't quite seem to play into uh, the same sort of narrative of um, of foreign contamination, um, which is really interesting to me. So the, you know, they're they're actual um, or you know, purportedly they're actual foreign bodies that you're ingesting, um, and yet there's a way that it it seems to be held up as um, uh, as something that will kind of you know transfer some kind of preservative healing, whether that has to do with the way that the bodies are you know. Preserved and, and embalmed in these, um, you know, uh, you know, through the the particular processes of, of a particular country, as you know, as as one of these writers was saying, um, and and it just, I think that's, um, it, I think it provides then a, an interesting and, and strange contradiction to um, right the idea of foreign contamination, um, at the same time, kind of being played up for its maybe discussed fa factor in, in uh, an author like Webster. Um, so definitely some, some uh, I think, interesting tensions to, to tease out there. So thank you. So uh, continuing with mummies, uh, there's another question for you, Jennifer. Um, this is by uh, Diana Dunford. And uh, so you basically quoted mummies as anciently dead. So are there any accounts or explanations of mummies coming from those more recently dead? Or is it the length of uh, time that the mummy has been dead for that. Is it related to the efficacy of mummy for medicinal purposes? Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question, and um, and I, I also want to say that Kitanjali has also written on <laughs> on mummy. Another plug for her, her brilliant book. Um, I, you know, um, yes, so there are accounts of um, of uh, of mummy coming from the recently dead, and actually this idea of. Um, uh, of you know what you actually get um, or purchase from some of the apothecary shops is um, actually derived from local bodies. So whether it's recently executed criminals um, or kind of local graves, and um, and Louise Noble, who has written on um, medicinal cannibalism and, and has kind of written um, at length on mummy. Um, I have her book around here too, but I don't have it sort of handy to, to do a show and tell there. Um, but, you know, sh she sort of speculates and, and kind of theorizes that it is about the length of time um, for her. So she, she seemed to emphasize that there was something about the anciently dead um, and kind of the anciently embalmed bodies that um, maybe by virtue of having stood the test of time, um, you know, prove that, that they have that sort of, um, that, that efficacy. Uh, whereas, um, 
uh, whereas the local bodies, and I think this is some, this is a really interesting distinction that I've seen in some of the descriptions too. Um, it, it seems like some of the local or maybe recently executed bodies, local, right, it, um, uh, from the vantage point of, of the English or the Europeans, um, it constituted a kind of false mummy or a counterfeit mummy. And so there was this idea that the true mummy, um, you know, was derived from these foreign bodies um, and that false mummy came from um, local bodies. So that wasn't actually the, the true one. Um, and so there is, there does seem to be a certain kind of, um, uh, you know, you know whether it's sort of about the the foreignness and the geography that does seem to be a part of it, um, but the temporal aspect seems to be a part of it as well. So this idea of kind of length of time, um, kind of contributing to it. So, so thank you for that question. So the next question uh, is for everybody on the panel. It's by Brian, and uh, basically there's significant debates currently about the concept of race and racism in the medieval and early modern Med Mediterranean, Atlantic, and Indian, Indian Ocean worlds. So how do the panelists see the debate about race prior to the full development of transatlantic slave trade? How does the global diffusion of American and Southeast Asian foods in the early modern period relate to developing notions of race, racial categorization, and racism? There's a lot of questions there, and I'll let anyone take them first and then come to them. Nick, do you want to go? Or? Sure. I, I mean, yeah, it's a great question. I think for me, for me, I know that with the work that I do, I'm always, both with the work that I do, the way in which I theorize and understand race and processes of racialization to operate during the period. And then on, and then in, in another sense, the ways in which I challenge my students to think about race and forms of racialization in early modern Iberia. I think I would say that materiality and food have everything to do with the topic. Um, because again, particularly in my wheelhouse of, of thinking about the racialization of, 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 of blackness and African and African descended people um, and communities in early modern Iberia, there's so many ways both in literary texts or the fiction of literature and in the real uh, as a category or real life evidence in archives, there's so, there are countless examples where um, Africans and their descendants utilized, counted on food, what you ate, what you didn't eat, to subvert the Inquisition, to challenge the Inquisition as an example, talking about transubstantiation, talking about the consumption of the Eucharist. There are a variety of really fascinating Inquisition cases where Black women who are sentenced by the Inquisition, and when you read their testimonies and the really cool ways in which um, you know, they're really playing with and manipulating what, you know, the, the sanctity of the, you know, of, of what Christ's body is, so on and so forth. And they're also, and not just with African descended women, but with um, Morisco women as well. You see interesting cases with that. Um, also as an example, and, you know, in literary texts, again, they're, for me, they're really interesting ways that require, you know, much more attention um, and analysis to really tease out, um, again, how different types of foods are, are used, again, to, you know, racialize um, in my, you know, for the materials that I'm looking at and focus, focusing on, um, you know, Black communities. And again, this is happening before and during um, the, the transatlantic slave trade. Um, because again, there were, you know, there were, there was contact between um, Iberia and different, you know, Iberian, you know, polities and saw in the relationship to sovereignty as well is really important to think about taking the transatlantic slave trade out of the equation the more so up and down vertical um, relationships and interactions um, between Portugal, the Kingdom of Congo, where you also come across interesting materials um, that have to do with food materiality, 
And a lot of this work is, you know, it's been done by Cecile Formont as an example. Um, so that would be my like, take on that question, I think. If maybe I could just add to that, Neha, I think there are two parts to that question. Uh, there's one about how we, you know, what are the different dimensions that we are addressing in the term race? And I think yeah. it's what I was trying to speak of in the culinary contact zone that it indicates cultural and geographical difference. Uh, and in, in one way, it indicates uh, religious difference in some aspects. Uh, and then it also indicates difference in skin color uh, that food is thought to affect uh, in some cases, in many cases, actually. So that's one part of the question. The other part is a methodological question. You know, what, what do we do with the cat category of race? How do we nuance the category of race, as I think you were asking yesterday, Neha, uh, when yeah. we're speaking about uh, the early modern context or a pre-transatlantic uh, slave trade context? And I would say that we nuance it uh, as we do any framework or any category that we're using uh, from the present to look at the materials of the past. Uh, we have to nuance the category of food itself in the same way. Uh, and uh, both food and race in that sense are malleable categories in this context. And uh, I think all of our discussions are looking at that both with regard to both key terms. I guess I'll jump in really briefly. And I'm sorry, there are leaf blowers, so I'm not sure if, <laughs> um, if, if that's sort of, um, you know, coming into the, into the sound here. Um, I think, uh, yeah, just, just to kind of go off of, uh, of, of what both Nick and, and Gitanjali were saying, um, I think as I was thinking about this question too, um, uh, and, and um, kind of the, the idea of, uh, of thinking about the concept of race and racism before, um, uh, say, the, the full development of the, the transatlantic slave trade, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I've, I've thought a lot about, um, for me, uh, Patricia Akimi's really useful um, definition of race. I'm sorry if you could hear the leaf flowers um, as a structural relationship um, between fluctuating ideas of, of about human differences and then shifting power relations. And I think, um, you know, in terms of kind of thinking about race, it's um, that that's always sort of been there, right? This kind of the 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 urge to um, want to kind of think about human difference um, and, and to think about power in relation to that. Um, and then to just, just to kind of add a brief thing about um, kind of the, the diffusion of different kinds of foods. Um, what struck me about the question um, or something that's been influential to me is Rebecca Earle's work, uh, I think it's called The Body of the Conquistador and um, kind of looking at the way that um, uh, that the that Spaniards were kind of co going over to um, the Americas, and um, the the humoral kind of um, system of knowledge that uh, that sort of um, led to the belief that that you know that if Europeans were to consume the foods of say the Amerindians, um, they would they could actually you know change their their racial makeup. Um, uh, so I just wanted to kind of add add that as another source. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we have another question from Julia. And this question is, is there a difference in the anxiety level over ingesting foreign foods, body or otherwise, based on the site of consumption? Does it have a strongly different valence based on whether the site of consumption is the European home or a foreign uh, location? Hi, Julia. Uh, and I think... Um, you know, that's something I tried to look at a lot in all of the materials I was uh, putting together for the book. And I think it seemed hard to distinguish between uh, the space of the home and then the space uh, in, in, you know, contact zones abroad or on voyages. Uh, and uh, there is inconsistency. There is desire in the space of the kitchen, but there's also disgust in the space of the kitchen. There is desire in the contact zone, as I was, you know, trying to show with Edward Terry and Manucci, who really immerse themselves in those culinary rituals. But then there's also disgust in those travels. Uh, so I, you know, that's why it seemed important to treat both spaces as contact zones uh, rather than, you know, the only the one in faraway lands. Uh, where, you know, we see both affects, essentially, wherever that food is encountered. Nick, would you want to also add uh, to that? Could you repeat the question a second so time? So is there 
any difference in the anxiety level over ingesting foreign foods based on the site of consumption, uh, whether it's being consumed in the European home or in a foreign location. So there's a difference in the valence based on this. Great. I would say, so in one, there's one particular um, poem called Hello Femandinga by Rodrigo de Reynosa, writing in the early 1500s in, um, in Castile. And so in this particular poem, it's a poem in dialogue between an African woman by the name of Comba and an African man by the name of Jorge. And immediately when thinking about anxieties and consumption, that particular text comes to mind because these two characters, obviously two you know, African, Black African um, character speakers, um, they use, so with these back and forth insults that, that happen and, and, and that happen and occur throughout the poem, food particularly is used. So Komba, will assert herself and, you know, say that I'm better than you because, you know, I'm not, because I eat, you know, these types of foods or, or I don't eat, you know, rotten fish heads and I don't eat dung beetles like your people do from who are Wolof or whatever. And then he'll reply back and say, well, you know, you ugly, you know, whatever, so on. Because it's a very obscene form with a lot of vulgarity and such. But that aside, you know, Jorge's case is really, or his replies are interesting because we learn in the poem and the text that he's an Islamicized African. And so he'll say in using, so in his Africanized Castilian pops up Arabisms. And so he'll say that, well, my people are better than your people from Guinea or wherever it is you're from because we eat good couscous. Or and so there's this repetition. So that that's one immediate um, example that that particularly stands out right now. But there are a host of examples. Yeah, there are tons of examples where again, you know, anxieties pop up. And but again, immediately that's one example that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, would you like to pitch in? I'm um, sure. I think that. Leaf flowers have gone slightly, slightly further away. Um, uh, yeah, I think that there's, um, you know, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, so I'm like trying to find the question again. <laughs> oh, right, the the anxiety level about um, ingesting based on the site of consumption, um, and I, I think that's a really, um, I, I think that's a really kind of powerful question to, to take a look at. And I'm, I'm thinking here about, um, about some of Rebecca uh, Wall's, I'm sorry, Earl, Rebecca Earl's um, work on, um, you know, what it meant for, um, for Europeans to be kind of going to these other places. And a number of other scholars have done work on this too. Um, and what it means to, um, right, to, to kind of, um, ingest the food of different groups, um, and then also for um, for Rebecca Earle, uh, the the real desire to see if they can um, right start start bringing in their own local crops over to these other you know regions, and that kind of you know starting um, uh, starting this this whole tension about agriculture as well, right, and that really kind of feeding into foodways and. Um, uh, and and these ideas of human difference um, and kind of what uh, the the problematic um, saying of of you are what you eat or you know um, any kind of uh, uh, variations of that. Thank you. Uh, so now we'll just move on to our last official question. And for the other questions, uh, we can stay back and we can try to answer them once the session is officially over. Uh, so Hannah Smith says, uh, she thanks ev uh, everyone for a fascinating session. Um, and, she, and there's a question about mummies for Gitanjali and Jennifer. Uh, so uh, Hannah talks about this poem uh, called Love's Alchemy, uh, which ends with hope not for mind in women, at their best sweetness and wit, uh, they are but mummy possessed. Uh, it's lo uh, lovely to, uh, lovely, I know how you've seen these in, like instances of mummies as gendered ingredients, uh, or is this just like one-off instance? 
Yeah, that's that's a good question because I, um, I uh, in terms of the gender and and I think one one instance that I'm thinking about um, even um, even if the the text is not specifically referring to women um, is is in John Webster's The, the Duchess of Malfi where um, you know Basila refers to the Duchess as um, a salvatory of green mummy. Um, and, um, and, and that is an instance that I've been thinking about in, in kind of a, a gendered way as well, in the way that the Duchess, um, uh, the, the Duchess sort, is sort of being constructed as um, a, a, kind of, a, a kind of ingredient, right? It, it kind of comes in one of Basile's meditations about kind of what, what human flesh is, and he refers to puff pastry, curdled milk, um, and, uh, and of course, this kind of box of mummy, um, and thinking about the ways that, that she's in circulation. Um, and, uh, so, you know, so that's just another, I think one instance I can kind of think of, um, but definitely something that I want to, uh, think a little bit more about too. Mm -hmm. Um, go ahead now. No, 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 sorry. Oh, no, just to say that, uh, in it's gendered also in the sense that we see so many reference to it in, uh, female authored recipes. Uh, where, you know, or at least recipes where there's instructions for how women can use it in their kitchen. But then the one instance that we have in Samuel Burkus's uh, narratives where he describes mummy being uh, obtained, uh, it is the body of a decapitated male moor. Uh, it's a very violent recipe where, you know, the process of juicing the moor, watching uh, the fluid drip uh, is, is, you know, from the male body, but then uh, included in remedies that are in the kitchen that you know, the housewife would use for various curative purposes. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll just squeeze in one last question uh, from Carson, and it continues with the theme of recipes, where could you talk a little bit about different types of medicines and recipes that mummy is most often included in? Is there any c connection of interest between the purpose of the medicine and act of consuming the foreign body? And after this, we can just stick around for a little more of an informal conversation. There are salves for like facial treatments. Uh, there are ingredients for children prone to bedwetting in which I recall uh, some bits of mummy being used. Uh, in, in, in most cases it's curative, but then in some cases we see that it's cosmetic as well, or it will eventually have cosmetic impact. Yeah, I, I would agree with um, Kitanjali and um, like it, it, uh, there, there doesn't really seem to be um, a lot of acknowledgement about kind of the the, the foreignness of of mummy in the recipes themselves, um, and so I have seen them right in in kind of these curative solves. Uh, I think I saw a recipe that was, um, you know, that was claiming to be you know the ba basically the best solve in the world, right? It can it can cure any number of diseases, um, and one of the ingredients happens happens to be mummy. So you know whether that's sort of about um, whether that's implicitly about the kind of um, the the kind of efficacy that the the ingredient or the substance was was purported to have, and whether that efficacy is is determined on on you know whether it being foreign or not, um, uh, you know, might be something to kind of parse out uh, across all of these texts. But yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So. Um... Should we take in a couple of more questions if you, if the three of you have time or should we just wrap the panel because we have a couple of more questions. I do. Sorry. Well, I, I, do, I do remember Leah kind of wanting, um, potentially offering to continue the, the previous panel's conversations too. So I didn't want to sort of, you know, um, yeah. take over. <laughs> so, okay, so I think we'll wrap this panel up then. Well, we can try to attempt to have a discussion amongst ourselves uh, and, and see where it leads us. I know there are still there are some questions amongst the panelists um, and some conversations taking place here that we could also bring up. And it, whoever's on screen and would like to present themselves and be part of the conversation, feel free. And uh, to, to attendees feel welcome to add in any other questions you might have if you if you're up to it. 
I see a question in the chat that actually asks something about uh, the expression uh, and uh, you are what you eat and where it comes from, mm -hmm. uh, from Karen. And uh, I just want to answer that. Uh, we think uh, that it might be a misquotation of uh, Brillat Savarin, you know, the 18th century gastronomes. Tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. Uh, and it's possibly a corruption of that. You are what you eat uh, becomes a version of that. And then we see it as a cliche everywhere. If I could just jump in a, a, a second, if I'm not interrupting anything. I, I find, just to go back to the idea of, uh, that we were discussing about what make, made people feel uncomfortable. And I, I understand what Nick is saying. Uh, and of course, where you're consuming can be important because of the, the people that you are with and you might feel uncomfortable about who you are with. And I think there are lots of literary examples where people end up in the wrong place and they're eating with people that they, they wouldn't want to be eating with. But it seems to me that there's a whole other level of complexity when you are consuming food because up until certainly let's say the, the beginning of the 18th century the idea is that whatever you put in your body it somehow modifies your body so therefore if you eat the wrong thing you're really doing something that's very problematic to, for the body and that's why you have all these uh, constructions about what you should eat and when you should eat and how you should eat it and what the combinations are etc cetera, etc cetera. So maybe that, that's maybe the, the most important thing is that when you're eating outside of your sphere of uh, your cultural sphere, uh, that you're exposed to things that you don't know exactly what kind of an effect they have on your body. And you, you try to rely on some kind of general theories, but you're, you're never quite sure about it. And so that, that I think is much more threatening than actually eating with people who tomorrow morning you might not be with them anymore. But I think so, I mean, but I think sort of provide, you know, more context of on that particular text, that at least the way that I, I mean, in that particular passage and in this, in the chapter from where, from where it comes in my book, I think that even that type of logic can still apply because if you were in the context of of the ways in which i mean taking whiteness out of the scenario and taking out european constructed and european understood theories of food consumption in a very niche community of african descended people across the globe whether you're in continental europe or in the americas and even more so in continental Africa as well, these specific ethno, ethnic groups, these nations, these kingdoms understand their, through food, they understand what, who they are. Through food, through what is eaten, what's consumed in the body, what is not consumed in the body has profound implications. So for me in this particular text, even though you know it is a literary fiction, they're the way in which the poet meticulously ascribes and, and unites and links ethnicity or specific sub-Saharan African ethnicities from West Africa and West Central Africa, I think that the same argument could be made or be understood in the ways in which Europeans, writing for Europeans, um, you know, theorize consumption and so on and so forth. So I think for me, at least, think again, thinking about the specificity of, of sub-Saharan African blackness as it, as it plays out with particular ethnic groups, there's a complete hierarchy and an elitism um, that thing gets used to make specific cases for against um, other um other groups no but so yeah. you're, you're, you're again think, saying yeah. context but also content you see what i mean 
we're talking about both things. At least that's what I'm understanding what you're saying is that it's not just a question of context. It's also a question of what is being consumed and what it does theoretically to your body. Uh, Nick, do you want to respond to that? Or? No, I've made my case. I've made my point. Thank you. Okay. okay. So there's a question from Marisa, which uh, addresses both the panels. And uh, she thanks us for these great talks and goes on to say that each of you is thinking about interculinary, uh, intercultural culinary encounter and all of you demonstrate that there's no single moment of encounter, but rather recursive and repetitive encounters. And these assessments mark moments wherein foods are either assimilated or remain strange and unassimilated. So can you talk a little more about repetition, return, and repeat, repeated encounters uh, with racialized foods and bodies and how this figures in our work? Yeah, thank you for that question for us. I think that's really, oh, sorry. I don't know if Kitajali, you were good. Um, uh, I, I think that's a really, um, uh, a really poignant question about uh, these these kind of repeated encounters with with racialized food and bodies and um, and I think that um, it, it it does very much sort of uh, I think figure and even kind of thinking about these um, notions uh, of of race in the period as as fluid right and and kind of the the idea of the body as as always kind of being in transition or um, you know being so um, uh, so kind of vulnerable to uh, to what it takes in, um, and I think that um, I think there's something to um, so so something that I think that I'm I'm trying to work through in terms of um, you know uh, racialized foods and bodies um, in my work is this idea of. Uh, um, kind of largely and abstractly on on preservation. So what does it mean to kind of um, preserve the body, right, and preserve the body to food or through food and, and to kind of sustain it. it, it means to constantly be um, kind of replenishing it. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, what does that mean in terms of being able to, um, uh, to eventually, you know, whether it's transform the body um, racially or ethnically, or what does it mean to be able to use these recipes, right, and um, and to be able to to say um, you know cleanse oneself or something right so I'm, I'm thinking even of like cosmetic recipes that um, that you know can be seen in a racialized lens and um, you know you know what it takes to continually you know um, wash your face right with a particular uh, remedy so that it it cleanses it and whitens it um, and so you know I'm interested in kind of these these processes of you know. Of, of preservation and transformation and, and how that kind of incorporates race. So that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking, but definitely something I'll continue to think about. So thank you. I just wanted to address that repetitive nature of that encounter, because that's something that comes up so much. You know, the discourse of the Cape is not my term. That's actually Kurtzi's term for uh, that entire body of travelogues uh, that's written around the Cape of Good Hope. And at some point going through that literature, it's so tedious to see that at a certain point in the narrative, what I just read very briefly today happens every single time. The narrative is halted, uh, the excrement and the uh, disgust at the guts is noted, uh, the difficulty of watching that scene is noted, and then the travelogue continues. And I have to wonder how much of that is a performance. I don't mean to suggest that there isn't disgust uh, at that scene, but I just you know, I just find that it somehow becomes a convention in the discourse of the Cape that at this particular juncture to somehow uh, record a sense of authenticity. I was there, I saw, uh, I felt that then we have this performance of disgust. And that's why that doesn't get assimilated at all as food. There is one encounter that comes all the way at the end of the discourse of the Cape, closer to this 18th century, where one traveler actually notes that how would the Hottentots look at cheese? Wouldn't they be disgusted by it, much like we are disgusted by those, uh, uh, you know, innards that we're talking about? Uh, but that's the only point in which we see a reflection on that trope. But I think that's also where that comes from. It's kind of like, you know, you go to Paris, you take a picture of the Eiffel Tower, you go there, you have to note that sense of disgust in the contact zone. Otherwise, there isn't very similitude. You weren't actually there. Also, Gitanjali, I think in context of your work, because you deal with English travelers, 
uh, in South Asia and the Mughal context, it's also really interesting to note how these men were placed within the court or outside the court, because that really changes the gaze. Uh, because somebody like a Manuchi, who's a very low-level mercenary in the Mughal army, is constantly praising his patron, Dara, and his uh, eating habits while he's extremely uh, critical of his brother's eating habits, though his brother's eating habits are considered more Puritan in that, uh, in Islamic context. So it's also really interesting to see how these men were placed within the local settings and then how they respond to the food habits. I just wanted to bring that in. Yeah, and you know, those are also spaces in which you see, or at least in some of those travelogues where you sense some disgust that is ex experienced from the one who is being observed, uh, where, you know, those travelogues have to make note of the fact that uh, people in the court, say, for instance, did not want to dine with some travelers or did all they could to avoid them, seeing them as the object of disgust. Uh, so, you know, Thomas Rowe is an example of that. Yeah. Nick, would you like to comment? Sure. As far as in the, at least in the materials that I'm aware of, I would say across the spectrum with the repetition of, you know, food and racialization, you see a lot of represent or repetition of, of pork and wine that immediately comes to my mind with that have a lot to do with the anti-Islamic, anti-Semitic um, concerns, preoccupations, anxieties on the peninsula with the various Islamic and Jewish um, communities. And so, again, in the many of the materials that I work with, with the Af Sub-Saharan African populations, it's interesting to see how, you know, both in literary texts and archival documents, be it in the Inquisition as an example, different testimonies where that comes up, this, rep this repetition of, 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 of of accusing and spying and hearsay of, of the consumption or not consuming, um, you know, of, of wine or, or, or pork products um, to make allegations against or to prove that, you know, that there's crypto hudaisantes, there's crypto Jews, you know, in the neighborhood or in the vicinity as an example. So, so, it's, so it's interesting to see how for me at least, in the Sub-Saharan African populations also participating in this policing of, 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 of Jews and Muslims, or these crypto under the surface um, with respect to religion as race. Uh, thank you all for sticking around. Uh, I'll now hand it over to Leah. And I think we'll wrap this up. Thank you now. for this wonderful panel. Both panels were incredibly insightful and they work very well together and just demonstrated how much food is wrapped up into every part of society and culture. Uh, so some of you who are joining us at four o'clock for the Transcribathon with Heather, we're going to be transcribing recipe. Hope to see some of you there. Otherwise, come back Friday, Saturday for more panels. And Monday, we have another public program devoted to indigenous food ways that I hope you'll join us at. Uh, it's on Indigenous Peoples Day, so please come celebrate with us and uh, stay well, everybody. Thank you.